own doings that are in our lives, then the need for repentance isn't there. It's altogether eliminated. And for so many people, that word repentance is now an archaic term. It belongs to yesterday. It's equated with sackcloth. It's equated with ashes and all old-timey mourners' benches. Some see repentance as something we do only when we get caught. But repentance is a whole lot more than just blurting out, I'm sorry if I get caught cheating on my taxes or if I get caught cheating on our wives. And repentance is a whole lot more than just turning over a new leaf. You know what repentance means. I know what it means. It means turning around and going in another direction. When John the Baptist wanted his audience to hear, what he wanted them to hear was, turn your life around. Turn toward the Messiah. Now, I think it's important that we know that repentance is not negative. It doesn't make us downcast. It doesn't make us sad. Repentance lets us look up and look forward. It lets us break chains that hold us. It lets us break the fear of death that holds us back. Don't get stuck, friends, in the notion that repentance means feeling sorry and miserable. It doesn't. It's just this. It means you have stopped. I have stopped. We have stopped doing what's wrong. And now we simply do what is right. But repentance means one more thing, too. And it means a willingness to confront sin. To look at it head on. John the Baptist had this courage to confront sin and to challenge it wherever he met. King Herod, we know the story, had seduced his brother's wife and taken her to live with him. And although the people were outraged, their religious leaders said absolutely nothing because they had to be careful. They knew Herod could be violent. They knew Herod could be brutal if he got the vote. And John the Baptist knew it. But this wild-eyed preacher in his camel-haired clothes from the wilderness didn't think about his own safety. He only thought about God and what God wanted from him. And with outspoken courage, he denounced the king. And because of this, he was eventually put to death. To death. John paid the price. But look at the example it gives to us. So much is wrong with the society we live in today. You can make your list. I can make mine. Each one of us has our own stuff we deal with. Broken homes, increasing violence, dishonesty, corruption, the lack of integrity in public life, the slow slide of the church into adopting the ways of the world. Is there someone who's willing to be the watchman? Is there someone who's willing to sound the alarm? Who is going to call God's creation back to repentance. Who will have eyes only for the Lord and is not seeking approval from the world around us? It's not going to be a popular task. But I tell you, it is the task of Christ's church. This Advent, we are the forerunner who prepared the way by challenging we, we salute the one that was the forerunner by challenging the people's sins. He wasn't after the popular vote. He only was looking at God. Are we ready as the church of Jesus Christ to share that mission? And third and finally, John the Baptist prepared the way by pointing to Christ. John in the desert was really in the great tradition 
of the old Hebrew prophets. He was aware that time was running out. And in his burning message, and in his somewhat unpopular message, he didn't have time for the small stuff. He didn't have time for peripheral matters. He wasn't playing a game. He wasn't fooling with the shallow stuff. He knew that the sword of Herod's guard was soon going to flash and his tongue would be silent in the grave. Superficial people, they came from Jerusalem to see him and they were intrigued by this wild phenom that was out there that was preaching repentance. Frivolous things, frivolous things, such as the way he dressed, his diet, his oratorical style fascinated him. They wanted to interview him and they wanted to tell all of their friends, I met him and I talked to him. And they wanted to ask him questions. Who are you? They asked. And his answer was curt and absurd. I am not the Christ. Are you Elijah? No. Then who are you? They persisted. And John's answer, John's answer should be the ultimate goal of all of us who call ourselves followers of Christ. John's answer is simple. I am a voice. I am a voice. It was to John's everlasting credit that he saw something which nobody else had recognized. Others had anticipated that God would intervene in human affairs. They had predicted that the Messiah would come, but he would come as the head of a conquering army. He would be the lion of Judah, and he would lead them to the fight. But this wild man from the wilderness saw into the heart of his nation. And he saw into the heart of his, and the mind of his God. And this insight that he had has left for us and our children forever. Behold, he cries. Behold, as he sees Jesus approaching the river. Behold, not the lamb, the lion who will conquer and destroy, but behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's that lamb of God. It's that son of God. It's that baby in the manger. It's that Lamb of God. It's that Son of God. It's that risen Christ whom we call Savior. It's that Lamb of God. It's that Son of God. The one sitting now at God's right hand that someday will return and take those of us who claim Him in His name as Lord and Savior and will take us into eternity. I ask you, are we doing our work, which is His work here on earth? You know, that's my job. That's your job. That's our job as His followers. We are to be in the image, not only of God as He created us, we are to be in the image of John. Baptist. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.